So today we are going to be doing section 1.2. And this section is over exponents. This should be a review section for you. Um, it's the rules of exponents. We'll be using them a lot in the semester. So the more comfortable and confident you are with your exponent rules, the easier future topics are gonna be. So if this is something that you have in the past struggled with, or it's been a while and you need a refresher, I highly recommend you get some additional practice in just so as we go further in the semester into the topics we get, if you're confident in this area, it's gonna make future concepts and topics go um, a lot smoother, all right? So first, this one, especially when you're entering things into your calculator, too many times students believe that these two represent the same two things, but it does not. If your exponent is on the outside, this is telling you to take negative two times itself four times, which negative times negative is positive, times negative is negative, times negative is positive. So this would be positive 16, whereas this is telling you that only the two is raised to the fourth power. So you have your negative, but then it's two times two times two times two. So this answer is negative 16. So you have to be careful on this because students will view these as the same or they'll actually be given this and they'll put this into their calculator and so they'll get their sign incorrect. So be careful of that. Um, okay, that's gonna take us into the properties. of exponents. So the first one that we're gonna look at is the product rule. Which is X raised to the M power times X raised to the N power so as long as they have the same base, this rule does not apply if your base is different. So if this was X to the M times A to the N, this would not apply. So the base has to be the same, which gives tells us what we do is we add exponents. So an example of this would be X to the fifth times x to the six, they have the same base. So it's x to the five plus six or x to the 11. Um, you might see it written this way as well. Instead of this representing multiplication, you may see parentheses, but the same rule still applies because this is a product. So this still means y to the fourth times y squared. So it would be y to the four plus two, y to the sixth. Um, the next one is the quotient rule. And this rule states that x over m or x to the m power over x to the n power. If m, the exponent on top, is bigger than the exponent on the bottom, then you have x to the m minus n. If the exponent on the bottom is greater than the exponent on the top, then you have one over x to the n minus m. So in essence, whichever exponent is larger than that is what goes first. And so since this was on top, everything moves to the top. This was on bottom, it moves to the bottom. Um, so some examples, you could have x to the sixth over x squared. 
the exponent on top is larger, so that would give you x to the 6 minus 2 or x to the 4th. If it was x squared over x to the 6th, now the exponent on, in the denominator is larger, so you have x to the 6 minus 2, so you have 1 over x to the 4th. And these two are completely different answers. So you have to be extremely careful on this. All right, so then the third one is when we have a negative, whoops, didn't want that a two. That's supposed to be an N, sorry about that. Let me just rewrite it, X to the negative N. All right, in essence, when you have a negative exponent, if it's in the numerator, move that whole term to the denominator and that exponent becomes positive or vice versa. If it's on the bottom, move it to the top. So if you have something such as this, you can think of this as a fraction as all being over one. So it would become one over X to the N. This was in the numerator. You bring it down to the denominator and now the exponent is positive. Um, an example of this would be if you have three to the negative two, you first have to rewrite it as one over three squared, which would then become one ninth. You cannot expand a negative exponent. It has to become a positive exponent before you can expand it. Um, and then of course, vice versa, if you had the negative exponent in the denominator, move it to the numerator and it becomes positive. So if you had one over four to the negative two, again, if it's a negative exponent, do not expand it, not until it's positive. So it's in the denominator, so I'm gonna move it to the numerator and that would be 16. And then the other situation that you might see is a fractional or a fraction inside parentheses and the ne negative exponent outside of the parentheses. So we know we could actually rewrite this as X to the negative N over Y to the negative N and then just move this to the bottom and it becomes X to the N in the denominator and this we move to the numerator. And then this is the same thing as y over x to the n. So in essence, you can go straight from here to here. So it has a negative exponent on the outside of the parentheses. Look at your fraction, switch your fraction, and it becomes positive. And why? Because of what I showed you here. So an example of this, if you had 5 sevenths, to the negative one, you could go through this process if you wanted to, if it makes more sense to you, it's mathematically correct. Or if you recognize, you can say, hey, this is negative. I can make that positive as long as I flip this. And so it would be seven fifths. All right, so then the fourth one that we want to look at is when you have, that's supposed to be a zero, when your exponent is zero. And the thing to remember is anytime anything, I don't care what it is that's raised to the zero power, it is equal to one. So one thing I always tell my students is, if I told you I was going to give you 5 million raised to the zero power, that would mean I was going to give you $1. Okay, I know it seems odd, but just remember, anything raised to the zero power is equivalent to 1. All right, x, y, z raised to the n power. Notice the n is on the outside of the parentheses. So this is the same thing as x to the n, y to the n, 
z to the n. Now this works as long as what's inside the parentheses is a monomial, one term. We're going to encounter where we have a binomial inside the parentheses with the exponent on the outside. You cannot apply this same rule, so be very careful on that. Um, x to the m raised to the n power. So when you have an exponent raised to another exponent, you multiply those exponents. And I referred to this a little bit on the previous page. When you have this, this is the same thing as x to the n over y to the n. All right, so some possible examples. Let's say we have x, y cubed to the second power. There's actually two approaches to this. You could say, okay, everything that is inside the parentheses is taking time itself. So you would have x, y cubed times x, y cubed. This represents the squared. And then of course, that would be x times x times y cubed times y cubed. Then you add exponents, so you get x squared, y to the sixth. So that's one approach. The other approach is you could say, okay, that means x is squared and the y cubed is squared as well. So you get x squared, y to the sixth. So we get the exact same answer. Both approaches are correct. So you would not be counted off for doing it one way over the other. Um, another example, and this is where I was talking about, you have to be careful x plus y cubed squared. All right, so now I have a binomial. I do not have a monomial. So this rule right here where we did x to the n, y to the n, z to the n, that works because this is a monomial. This is not a monomial. You cannot, cannot, cannot say x squared plus y cubed to the second power. That is mathematically incorrect. So when you have some pluses or minuses inside the parentheses, you're just going to have to take it and expand it. So this would actually be x plus y cubed times x plus y cubed, and then you're going to FOIL. So course, you're going to take first times first, which is x squared. Outside is xy cubed plus one xy cubed. So you get plus two xy cubed and then y cubed plus y cubed. So you get plus y to the sixth. So this one right here, lots of students make errors on that. So be very careful on that. All right, x, y cubed squared times 2x, y, whoops, I want that on the outside, to the negative 2. All right, so notice this is positive. Leave it alone. This is negative. We have to move it first. So think of this as a fraction as over 1, all right? So being that this has a negative exponent and it's on the outside of the parentheses, I'm gonna move that whole thing 2xy to the denominator and now it becomes positive squared. This was already positive. So xy cubed squared, it's gonna remain in the numerator. And now what I'm gonna do is apply the rule that we looked at up above. And so my x is squared, my y cubed raised to the second, I'm going to multiply those exponents. My 2 is squared, 2 squared is 2 times 2, which is 4, x squared, y squared. And now I'm going to apply my quotient rules. Let's see if I can kind of get this all on here. So the four, there's nothing to reduce that with. So the four remains in the denominator. 
x squared over x squared. Well, think of that. That would be x to the 2 minus 2. x to the 0 is 1. So in essence, those cancel out. Here, 6 is larger. So I'm going to do y to the 6 minus 2, which is 4. All right. One more example. All right, 5a to the negative 2, 5a to the negative 1b. Now, there are actually um, two, I mean, there's more than one approach. So it's just whatever you recognize at first. Um, you could go ahead and move all of this to the denominator and then be sure and move that to the denominator as well. Um, I might have another student that goes, well, that's five to the negative two, a to the negative two times five times a to the negative one times b. And then from here go, okay, anything that's positive exponent, I'm gonna put on top. Anything that is negative exponent, I'm gonna to move to the bottom and it will become positive. And then it is recognizing, okay, so I have five B, five squared is 25. Here I have the same base, so I'm gonna add exponents. And then it's just a matter of reducing this so you get b over 5a cubed. Again, like I said, it is a matter of getting very confident and familiar with those exponent rules. The more confident and familiar you are, then you're gonna see those things and they're gonna come pretty easily. And how do you get better at something? Practice. Even if you don't like something and you're not confident in it, you're not going to get better at it unless you practice. Okay, how to handle, and we do this a lot throughout the semester, rational, which means there we're dealing with fractions, exponents. This, well, none of these go away, but as we progress into the semester, we deal a lot with fractional exponents and you are going to have to know how to handle them. Okay, so this tells me that if I have x raised to the m over n, that is the same thing as the bottom number tells you your root of converting it into a radical, the top, or the numerator stays with that base. Get that memorized. It is used a lot past this chapter. So if we have the square root of x, now notice I don't have anything here, but I don't know if you heard what I said, the square root. So if there's nothing there, it is understood that it is to the second root if I don't have an exponent here, it's understood to be one. So I could write this with a fractional exponent as one half. Whatever is with the base always goes to the numerator. The cube root of x to the fourth. Again, my base is x. This is your numerator. Your root is your denominator. over 81 raised to the one half power. Now you need to get memorized is if it's raised to the half power, that is the same thing as taking its square root. So this is like 16 to the one half over 81 to the one half because this is on the outside of the parentheses. 
this is the same thing as the square root. So this simplifies to four over nine. Nine fourths raised to the negative three halves. Okay, do not convert those into roots if that exponent is negative. You first have to get that negative exponent. You have to manipulate your problem to get it where it's positive. So we learned previously that if this is negative, all I have to do is switch these two. And now this is positive. Now we know we have four to the three halves over nine to the three halves. Okay, so the numerator stays with the base. This tells me I have a square root. So I have a square root of four cubed over a square root of nine cubed. Well, four times four times four is 64. Nine times nine times nine is 729, the square root of 64 is eight. The square, whoops, the square root of 729 is 27. All right, so that is a refresher, hopefully, on your exponent rules. Again, if any of this is new to you or it's been a long time since you have done it, I highly recommend you do more practice problems than um, maybe just what the assignment is for this section. You may need to go in the ebook and go to the end of the section. You can Google it, find extra problems. There's going to be a plethora of exponent rule uh, practice problems you can find um, on the internet. All right. Diminishing returns. Now, this is in relationship to something that we're going to be looking at called the learning curve. All right, here's what you need to know. First thing is the more reps you do, the less time you shave off of total time. Um, I can think of several examples. Um, psychology, um, you might look at and do an experiment where you have a maze and you have little white rats run through the maze and you time them. Well, the first time it's probably going to take them some time, then the more reps they do when they run it again, they run it again, they run it again, they run it again. So the more times they run it, then they're getting better and better at it. So they shave off time. Okay. Um, so CrossFit, if you're trying to get in 10 reps of a sh certain weight, well, the first time you do that weight to get 10 in probably takes you quite a bit of time. But then when you do those 10 reps again and again and again over a period of time, um, the next day you do that same weight, 10 reps and so forth, eventually you're going to get faster and faster. So that's what that's talking about. The more units you make, the less it costs you per unit to make. Okay, here's what I think of. Now, this deals with business. So of course, this is gonna come into play a lot in elementary calculus, because this is in essence a business calculus class. Um, I always think of like t-shirts, if you're gonna do a fundraiser on t-shirts, and if they tell you, hey, if you, we'll make the t-shirt, if you order 10 t-shirts with that logo, it's going to cost you $10 per t-shirt. 
But if you order 25 t-shirts from us, we'll reduce your cost to $9. And if you order 100, we'll reduce that cost to $8 per t-shirt. So this is what this is talking about. The more you make or the more you order, the less cost it is per unit. Now we're going to do an example with this. And it's basically a learning curve example. And we're going to talk about iPads. Whoops, iPad, not PAP. Okay. Now you'll be given the learning curve. So we're given that y equals 731.5 times x raised to the negative 0.47. And this is true for when x is, oops, I meant to put a less than there. Zero is less than x is less than or equal to 900. So this would be zero iPads all the way up to 900 iPads. So X is your number of units. So when I make one unit, output, which is your Y, is the labor hours. So when you make one unit, how much labor hours were involved. And obviously the more units you make that labor time is gonna get less and less, okay? So what I wanna do first is show you what this looks like on a graph and why it's called a learning curve. So here's Desmos, um, desmos.com. This is great, I use it a lot. Um, okay, so why? equals 731.5 x and I'm going to raise that to the negative 0.47 and I'm going to restrict x to be 0 less than x less than or equal to 900. Now what I wanted to show you something and I didn't have this completely whoops went the wrong way. Okay, when you first go into Desmos, it's gonna have this here, like this. So here's your, um, right in the middle, it, the order pair zero, zero. So you might plug this in and you'd go like, where's the graph? It's not graphing it. Well, look at what we're saying X can be all the way to 900. And what I can see is X is only going to 25. So if you don't find it, just zoom out, oh, there it is. Okay, so here's what I'm talking about as far as a learning curve. So X is the number of units. So that is this axis. Y is your labor hours. So one, if I make one, this is how many labor hours it's gonna take. And obviously the more units you make, the less labor hours are required so this is called a learning curve, okay? Diminishing returns gives you a learning curve. All right, now we'll come back to this first. So what we're gonna do is we're going to utilize this equation that was given. And you would be asked something such as how many labor hours per unit. So um, we could look at, okay, the number of iPads, and then it will give us how many labor hours. So if I put in five, what that means is five iPads made. So you would plug five into this calculator or into this equation, which of course you would just do 731.5 raised to the negative 0.47. 
731.47. Whoops, I forgot to put in five, didn't I? Sorry, 731.5 times five. So five is what is raised to the negative 0.47. There we go. All right, so we get approximately 343. So it gives us approximately 343 hours. So if you make only five iPads, this is the labor hours that is gonna be invested in that. And then if you put in 100, it's gonna give you approximately 84, 200, 60.6. So you notice that as X increases, Okay, so the more, the more iPads you make, your labor hours go down. This is the diminishing returns. So what I'm going to do is show you on Desmos, I'm going to enter those ordered pairs. So the first one was five iPads, approximately 343 hours. And if you'll notice, right there it is on the graph. Then the next one was 100 iPads, um, 84 labor hours. And then the last one we calculated was 260.6 labor hours. And so you can see that each of those points then is on your graph. All right. One last thing I want to show you with exponents, just as a reminder. Sorry. Okay. So y equals a b. Ooh, good golly. Disregard that. Here we go y equals x. Oh, my lanta. y equals a times x raised to the b. Why that was so hard for me to get out, I have no idea. So I just need to remind you that the number in front of the x variable, so in this case it's an a, but it would a lot of times be a number, that is called your coefficient. And the B, of course, we know that to be our exponent. So you're going to be given some problems such as 3 over 5x squared. And it is going to ask you, what is A, what is B? In essence, what is the coefficient, what is the exponent? So the first thing that I would do is I'd go, okay, I'm going to look at this. Um, there's a couple different ways you could look at it. It is the same thing as three fifths times one over X squared, which is the same thing as three fifths times X to the negative two which you don't need this times. In essence, that would just be three-fifths x to the negative two. So your coefficient is three-fifths. Your exponent is negative two. So in WebAssign, they'll give you something like this, and they will want you to tell them what the coefficient is and what the exponent is. All right, so if we have 4x to the 6th over the square root of 64x. All right, well, I have 4x to the 6th here. This is the same thing as the square root of 64 times the square root of x. So I want to get rid of the radicals. Um, one of those, it's very easy. So I'm going to leave this 4x to the 6th. We know the square root of 64 is 8. And then this is going to go back to what we learned previously in this lesson. This is a square root. It's a square root. This has an exponent of 1. So it's x to the 1 half. All right, well, we know we can reduce this. 
then what we have here is the same base. So we can apply the quotient rule. And so six is larger. So I would have X to the six minus one half over two. And six would be the same thing as 12 halves. If I just got a common denominator, 12 over two, 12 over two minus one over two is 11. So we would have X to the 11 halves over two. Okay, well, I found my exponent. Now, remember, there's understood to be a one here. So this is actually one half X to the 11 halves. So your coefficient is one half your exponent is 11 halves. All right.